Hello everyone, this is Darcy Ross and Monty Cook from Monty Cook Games. Today we are going to talk about world building and we are so excited to uh, dive into this huge, huge topic. Uh, so this is a part of our Your Best Game Ever video series related to the book Your Best Game Ever. Pretty exciting. <laughs> so this is going to be a, a tool book and not a rule book for players and GMs of any game system, of any experience or background. Um, this is going to be a book full of actionable advice and tools uh, that Monty Cook is uh, spearheading and is going to hopefully let everyone have their best games ever more often. Uh, so today, Monty is going to uh, and I are going to talk about world building and give you sort of our top tips of this big chapter in the book so that you can go about and have even better games with better world building. Yeah, this is a big topic, um, <laughs> way more than we can cover uh, just in this video, or really even way more that I could cover in just uh, a, one chapter of a book. Mm. There are, you know, entire books written about world building because world building is one of those things that uh, a GM does, but an author also does, right? A fantasy mm. author, a sci-fi author, they're, they're building a world. And so there's all this thought and, and ideas that go into, uh, you know, the, the idea of a novel, um, but that GMs can just steal, right? Because it's yeah. pretty much all exactly the same kind of thing. So, you know, please go out and find, you know, some great websites or books or whatever that are devoted to, to writers and just mentally cross out writer and write in GM. Exactly. Steal. <laughs> Steal all that good <laughs> advice that uh, exists around. Yeah. Um, but it can also be kind of overwhelming when there's that much that's been written on the topic. Uh, so hopefully we're going to break that down into some, some key points for you all today, whether you're a player or a GM, a designer. Um, everyone can uh, learn something from this, I think. Hope so. Yeah. <clears throat> so the first thing that I would do uh, as a GM when I'm you know sitting down and thinking about running a campaign is... Am I going to build the world from scratch, which is awesome and fun, and many of us, you know, think that that's the best part of GMing. Um, am I going to use a pre-made world? You know, am I going to buy something that a game designer did, or or use the setting that comes with the game? You know, like Numenera comes with uh, the ninth world, kind of already baked in. Uh, or am I going to borrow a world? And by borrowing, I mean like taking my favorite, you know science fiction setting, you know, Star Trek or something, and just setting the world there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I guess I'd probably also lump in, um, you know, setting it in the real world too, right? If you're going to just right. do a modern day horror game or something like that, you're sort of borrowing a world, but it's, it's the real world. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, starting with Earth. <laughs> right, right. Which of those do you like, Darcy? Goodness. Uh, so I was a player for a long time before I, I got in the GM's chair. And I, when I first started GMing, I, the idea of coming up with my own world and stuff was just too much. There's a lot I was already trying to learn. And so I definitely was on the lookout for a setting that kind of was, was pre-made that I could go, um, you know, dive into. And I, I was lucky that I just fell head over heels in love with Numenera. And so that was sort of where I started out. And what I've learned from running other, you know, worlds and other kinds of games is that I tend to lean toward, I like having something to inspire me. And so, um, you know, I, I would, I would maybe borrow, I would maybe purchase, I, I want, I like being able to flip through a few pages and get some inspiration or watch an episode of the show I'm trying to recapitulate. You know, I like that having some resource to inspire me, um, but not having so much information that I'll start contradicting the, um, you know, the world. Some worlds are built really tightly and have a lot of culture that really matters. Or if you're starting with Earth, right, history, there, there are real answers to how much C4 it takes to blow up a certain size building. And right. I find I'm not the GM who likes to have to have that level of detail kind of under my, my hood. I, I need a little more breathing room for making it up on the fly. <laughs> I like that freedom too, um, and uh, well, well, we'll get to believability here in a minute, but I think that uh, taking the temperature of the room, so to speak, and figuring out wow. like, you know, is there somebody sitting around the table who's gonna care that you just said the wrong amount of C4 uh, right. is really important, because if there is somebody who's gonna care, then then you probably need to care. Yeah. But if nobody cares, then 
then you don't have to care either, right? I mean, you're you're only doing it for the group of people sitting there at the table with you. You're not. That's such a good point. Across the world, right? Yeah, and um, you know the kind of players who who will want to go dig into a source book that I can hand them, who would love that versus some play some tables I have, you know I know that they're just they want to they're there for the action they're there for their character moments and they're just not going to want to dig into the kind of world building you know I could do a lot of world building that they won't want to touch uh, for certain groups so I think kind of talking to your players beforehand if you can and getting a sense of what they're up for um, as a GM is a really good skill <laughs> and as a player yeah. saying. I love this part of the world. Can we do more of this? Right. <laughs> Give me more world building. Right, right. And if you're the kind of GM like me, you're like, cool, I will happily give you more world building. Because uh, <laughs> that is, I mean, that's, a lot of things drew me into RPGs and kept me here, but world building is probably the biggest part of it. Mm. Um, I, I, I just really adore uh everything about world building, um, you know, coming up with the concepts and, and figuring out weird, you know, what are the, what are the things about this world that make it, you know, strange and unique. And, and I mean, you know, just sort of the basics, right? Oh, there's, it's a fantasy world. So there's magic, right? It, what, okay. So what now, what would the fact that there's magic, what, what effect would that have on this world? Right. Mm. Um, and that's, that's just the kind of stuff I like to just sit and think about. Um, so world building is is for me the 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 way to go. I like I like to think about borrowing worlds. Mm-hmm. Like I like to think about like you know some TV show or movie or whatever that I really love, you know, how would I run a game set in that world, you know, mm-hmm. like like the magicians or something like right. that. And I, I, but I don't really do it. Um I I think because I ultimately really love the world building, but mm-hmm. it's fun to think. And I also, um, even if you're like me and you love world building, uh, I think one of the best things that you can do is still go out and check out uh, uh, things, worlds that other people have have built, right? And see what they did and try to figure out why they did what they did. And you can learn so much, even if you're never going to play, you know, something set in in Eberron, right? You can still learn so much by going and checking out, uh, you know, the, those products and kind of see, oh, here's yeah. a cool idea. And yeah, and of course you can steal all the cool ideas too, right? For your own. Mm-hmm. That's part of being a GM. But it can make you ask interesting questions for whatever world you're, you're building or inspire you. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. So, um, so they all have their pluses and minuses. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I would say no matter which of those things that you do, uh, make the world your own, right? Um, once, once you start running a game, you know, I'll use Numenera as an example again. Once you start running a game of Numenera, the ninth world is what you say it is, not what the book says it is or anything like that. If you want to right. change things, if in the middle of a session you ad lib a thing that's now the way it works, right? Yeah. That is, it's yours. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so I think uh, when I first started GMing, um, one of the, I was really nervous about misconstruing the material, right? Like explaining the world, right? And so I had definitely built up a lot of anxiety <laughs> around various aspects of, um, you know, taking this world, uh, taking it in myself and really understanding it and then uh, displaying it to my players. So the next piece of advice might be, don't do that. Don't panic. It's going right. to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so For some people, I think just the very concept of, okay, now you have to build a whole world just sounds like the most intimidating, horrible bit of, of homework they've ever been assigned. Right. Um, and it doesn't need to be, um, mm-hmm. you know, you, people start, you know, when we talk about world building, you start thinking about, you know, Tolkien or George R. R. Martin or something, right? And uh, you don't, what you're doing is not trying to match up with with these people who have created settings that, you know, uh, entertain the world, right? You are, you are creating something for you and your friends. Right. And, and, 
you know, GMs are often much too hard on themselves, I think, when it comes to this kind of thing. Whatever world you create, your friends are going to like it, right? They're going to love it because it's where they get to have the character that they created run around and do stuff. And, right. And so, you know, it's, you know, the whole process is, is such a, it's such a group process. And, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit too. But, but, you know, even just the idea of, of, you know, players creating characters, Jim creates the setting. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, such a group effort that I think everyone becomes really invested in the world. Right. And uh, when I, one, one thing I've, I've definitely learned and loved is that, you know, the players uh, and everyone around the table is going to be, you know, it, it is such a shared collaborative experience, right? So everyone around the table is going to be engaging differently with different parts of the world building that come up, right? Me as a GM, I have my favorite bits. Um, I have, you know, maybe aspects of world building that another player has brought up that, that I'm inspired by. Um, and those, you know, one thing that's helped me relax is the fact that this world building is something that's shared between us. And so I, I am not really, I don't have to take it all on my shoulders because people will, you know, I, I have a player who loves crystalline structures. If I mention anything that has crystalline creatures or structures in it, I know that he's going to memorize every detail of that aspect and he's going to look for it and bring it up when it matters. And so he's kind of sharing in the the holding the information, the, you know, it can come from the, the players too. So they'll, uh, I don't, I don't need to constantly try to hook them. They've made their characters, they're involved and they're excited. So right. uh, I can lean back a little bit and, and not feel like I have to be the, the only uh, font of information of world building, right? And the whole archivist of it. <laughs> right. Right. And you know, that's a great point too. I mean, we're going to have a whole other video in this series that's about being a fantastic player, yes. but, um, but uh, I'm going to preface or, or, or preview something that I'm going to talk about there. And that is be somebody who's willing to get invested in the world, right? Be mm -hmm. interested in, in the setting that your character lives in now. Um, you know, ask questions and learn uh, uh, about, you know, whatever is your favorite thing, whether it be crystalline structures or, you know, geopolitics or, or whatever, right. whatever your thing is, right. Kind of, you know, ask the GM, well, what, what, you know, how does, how does this ecology work? Right. And maybe they've thought about it. Maybe they haven't, but it is something, you know, that will spur on the GM's creativity and it will show your interest. Yeah. And, man, showing interest is just it's like the biggest present you can give your GM, I think. Hallelujah. That is so true. <laughs> uh, it, man, you can, you communicate so much when you do that, when the little bit of interest, right? It gives the GM ideas and uh, places to go. And, you know, I think it gets the other players excited too, because they're like, oh, what should I be thinking about? You know, right. Uh, right. investment sort of begets more investment in a really cool way that, again, just serves to, um, take a lot of the ease of world building um, panic. <laughs> it sort of relieves that for me a lot anyway. Yeah. So um, I, I do have one quick question. Like, mm -hmm. um, so when I prep uh, for, for a given session or I'm, you know, introducing some new players to a, a new world, you know, I really boil it down to some, again, like you said, what, what makes this world special? There is magic, right? Can you boil it down to those, you know, core, uh, little bullet points. And I think I've noticed that I get better at like knowing what, what like signposts really help players like get, get that setting uh, over time as I run more and more one shots. Um, is there anything you do Monty or recommend for like how to prep for um, introducing someone to a new world? Um, so I think that the way players come to the setting is through their character, right? right. And so, you know, if you're like, if you get to all your friends together and say, Hey, everybody make up a D and D character. Cause we're going to start a new D and D campaign on Friday. They're going to show up with their, you know, their dwarf fighter and their elf wizard or, or whatever. And they're already going to have been thinking about what kind of person is this character going to be? Oh, what kind of spells can I cast? Whatever. Right. And so the more you can say to the guy playing the elf, Elves are from this land over here and, and, you know, they're, they worship this God and, and whatever, right. What, what whatever yeah. things you have decided about elves that make elves in your world interesting. 
that's that's sort of the gateway cool. right because they're already thinking about their character and now they're thinking about their character as it relates to the setting oh i love that you and know i love of, doing you're 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 an elf you would know x x right. useful thing you know as opposed to saying i'm going to pontificate about world building now right I, I love tying it to the character i think that's really smart and it helps people be invested in that information in that world i think yeah. it's a pitfall that gms fall into that because they're the gm right they they tend to start thinking about their world from the top down yeah but that's kind of overwhelming for a player to start you know if you start having to think about and here are the 13 nations and that you know you start getting all this information um so the you know just telling them what their character knows and and maybe even give them information you say you're an elf so only you know that right. you know on the other side of this woods there is this magical ocean or whatever um and that is that's also something like like someone's ears are going to prick up even more if you tell them that they're the only person who knows that oh that's such a that's a great move <laughs> <laughs> awesome um you know I, as we as we talk more we're getting into some of the details of the world building and and your particular setting um so so our next point is going to be about verisimilitude versus realism um what kind of advice do you have for us about what's the you know getting that dial just right of how much to perfectly <laughs> represent a world versus get the feel for it and sort of sketch so my advice and this is uh, this is going to ring wrong in a lot of ears, but uh, yeah. my advice is to take and just scrub the word realistic from your vocabulary. <laughs> Don't worry about realism. Mm. Worry about believability, right? Um, because as long as the players believe in the world, then it's going to feel realistic to them, mm. right? So, um, you know, we worry too much about realism, then suddenly, you know, as a GM, I've got to go and, you know, go to the library and get a stack of books on, you know, geography and geology and climatology and all this stuff, which mm -hmm. is fun, you know, if you've got the time and, and whatever. But uh, if you don't want to go that far, all you have to do is just make things believable, right? And the way that you make things believable is to make things true to people's expectations and, and, uh, and their own experiences, right? Rivers run downhill, right? They they flow from the mountains to the ocean, right? Uh, you know that that kind of thing, right? Um, you know, uh, it's it's if you're in the northern hemisphere of a of a planet, as you go north, it gets colder. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things, like you know, I'm sure a lot of people are going, well, duh, but that's the point, right? As long as you don't violate those sort of well, duh, uh, kind of moments. Uh, you know, your, your players are going to believe it. And, and that's the important thing. Um, oh, I like that a lot. It's yeah. just like what you were saying earlier, though, Darcy, like, figure out where your players sort of uh, uh, catch points are going to be, right? What's going to trip up a particular player? If you've got somebody who loves horses, yeah. Uh, don't get the horse details wrong or, or at least yeah. try not to, you know, get them egregiously wrong because that'll, they'll just throw their hands up and get, I don't know, horse people are really into horses and, and I, have, I have had experience with getting a horse detail wrong. Um, <laughs> oh, that's really funny. But yeah. Um, so yeah. So like, you know, Darcy, do you have those? I mean, you're a scientist, right? You're a, you've got, I'm sure all kinds of interesting bio, biological sort, uh, you know, biology things that you're like, oh no, that's not the way that works. Gosh, I'm, you know, I'm always asking the kind of biology questions as a player, um, and I uh, sometimes my my character wouldn't ask those questions, and I'm always like, oh, a little part of me is just dying to to ask, and if there's <laughs> another kind of sciencey character, I'm like you know, hoping they'll ask the question because I just really want to know, you know, I'm always hungry to kind of know the biological aspects of the new place we're in or, um, you know, I have those questions as a player. Um, but I think what, what's been fun for me, you know, especially as a scientist, I'm a snailologist, right? Like I, I have just enough knowledge to be a danger in every other aspect of, you know, science, right? <laughs> so I think something that's been fun for me has been 
you know, I, and I, I run games for a lot of scientists, right, who are paleontologists and geologists and care deeply about topography and will ask about the mineral composition of that <laughs> bedrock over there and will care and, and love that stuff, right? And so when I am out of my depth, I've definitely enjoyed, uh, and I think this is going to be a thing we, you know, we've talked about a little earlier, but, you know, I love turning to that player who knows a lot about horses and saying, uh, you know, here's, here's an aspect about these horses, you know, or you tell me about it. Right. Mm. Or, or if I, a good idea. two like solutions I found to the, Ooh, a player I want or a GM doesn't quite have the, the know how to, to bring this to life in the way I want. The sort of two tools I have are, uh, turn it to the person who has the expertise and have them share that bit of world building with you and sort of yes. And yes, but no, and no, but to make sure it fits. But uh, so there's sort of turn it to the other person. And then there's also the, oh, I said something factually incorrect about this particular mineral. Um, sometimes I like stick to my guns and I say, this is a weird thing. Yes, you, you are right. In fact, uh, you shouldn't be able to find metamorphic rock here. Isn't that strange? And then <laughs> seriously into the distance. And sometimes something comes of it and sometimes nothing does. But, you know, that we're playing in these you know, fictional settings, sometimes you can embrace those, uh, in this, those discrepancies can be part of the fun, right? That error can now turn into a cool plot moment or something like that. (laughs) That is, that is absolutely one of my main GM tricks is to turn my mistakes into mysteries, right? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I, I love that. And I love what you said too, about turning to the player, because that's, that's exactly the advice that I give to GMs who say, hey, I've got this rules lawyer in my group. Right. Um, and I, I don't know what to do. And, and my answer is, you know, use them, right? Yeah. If, if they're the one who are, you know, who are telling you, uh, you know, well, no, that's the wrong range for that spell, then develop a, a process in your game where you say, hey, what's the range for that spell? And then you don't have to look it up because they just know. Yeah. And, and that's awesome. And they feel, right, people who are rules layers usually are doing it because they love the rules and they want yeah. to be that expert. So let them, right? If you've got someone who loves snails and suddenly we're on the snail adventure. Yep. I mean, if I was running that game, I would be turning to Darcy all the time, right? <laughs> and, and saying, you know, well, explain what this is. and. Uh. <laughs> and and it just it's such a great feeling of contribution. I, it's such a win-win solution when you can make that work. Uh, so I, I think that's great advice. It's it's funny that I never looked at it that way. Where you know the rules lawyer, lawyer asset is the same as kind of in kind of a world building way, right? People have these expertises, make them assets, and not you know turn that thing that could be kind of a bummer as you don't do it quite right. Make that an asset for your game. Very cool. It's the same thing too if you're using like a like a pre-existing setting, whether it be oh, a perfect. RPG setting or like, you know, if you're running something in the Star Wars universe and you've got someone who knows Star Wars more than you, yeah, you say, oh, where where is that planet, right? Or whatever, right? And, oh man, that's delightful. Um, and yeah, so we've been talking about kind of top-down uh, world building versus. Uh, trying to emerge from characters and uh, and sort of filling in the the bits of the world that your players are really going to want to engage with and the story you're going to tell is is going to make important, right? So um, one of the next topics we want to impart is about starting small. <laughs> so right. if you want to, what would you recommend? How do, how do you start small, Monty? Well, so uh, I, I think that the way to think about this, see, it's, it, it's another sort of trap, I think, or maybe it's the, maybe it's the same trap uh, that I was talking about before about you know we we tend to think about you know the whole world and and whatnot, but I would start small by by focusing on just what the players are going to encounter in that first session, right? Mm-hmm. And so like they might be starting out in a small village somewhere, and you know that there's this big important capital city far off in the distance and that's where all the action is and and there's all kinds of important stuff that's going to happen to them after they get some experience and go off and resist the temptation to spend all your prep time on that city um, and focus instead on that village that they're going to see and you will get so much mileage 
mm-hmm. out of spending time, you know, making the the shopkeeper in the first little village that they go to really interesting, uh, as opposed to spending that time, you know, detailing the religion of the next nation over, right? Yeah. Uh, it. <laughs> So in that way, it's not even world building, right? You're, you're, you're starting so small that your you're, world building isn't even really the right word because you're not building a world. You are, you're, you're building the world that the players see, which at first is just going to probably be really small. Now, that, that, that's if it's like a, a fantasy or a medieval setting. And so, but, but the same kind of thing can be applied if you're playing a science fiction game. Mm. Don't worry about the whole galactic empire. Don't worry about... Uh, you know, all those things, think about the first place where they're going to start. What's, what's the spaceport that they start in look like and what's the inside of their spaceship look like and, and those kinds of things and focus just on that. Um, Because really like, you know, one of the bits of advice that we always tell writers is, you know, start out strong. You've got to hook the, you've got to hook the reader really early on, have the first Mm -hmm. few paragraphs of your book be fantastic. Same is true for a campaign in the first session, mm-hmm. right? Have that first session be really, really something special and uh, they'll be hooked and you can, you know, develop the whole rest of the Galactic Empire later. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, I, I also think that I sometimes when I am prepping for a session, I I feel this you know, especially in a campaign, which I, I really am still pretty new to. I ran a lot of one shots and I've kind of got that format down and campaign prep is still a little mysterious to me, but this, I've felt nervous about, you know, okay, I have to get the whole arc, the whole plot ready and in my head, you know, I've had, I've had that feeling. And then I'm like, no, I really just need to prep for this first session. But, but if I, oh, I'm worried about over prepping for that first session, like, you know, if I have this really cool NPC and they kind of go off in a different direction, at first I, I would feel like, oh, I kind of, I over prepped these specific details for that first session. But what I've learned later is that no prep is wasted, right? right. Um, especially when you're down at that, um, I'm looking through the goggles of my player level, right? If I've prepped a cool NPC that I think they'll bond with and they ignore them in the first village, that is an NPC I can take and reskin gently over in the galactic empire's, uh, you know, domain later on, right? So I, I do think that, especially when I prep specific details, kind of at that at that um, player's eye, that character's eye level, uh, that stuff I I will come back to. It's just it's such a good thing to have um, in my toolkit to bring out whenever they're they're moving their goggles to somewhere I didn't expect. I can give them something cool. Um, uh, engaging some person with a neat accent, right? I have that ready to, to hook them. Um, and so, yeah, I, I find that that work spent on that level is absolutely never wasted for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I would add one more thing on the, the start small, uh, the advantages of starting small. And that is if I, you know, if I'm running a fantasy game and I completely map out my entire continent and I figure out everywhere where everything lives and here's where all the cool old ruins are or whatever, and then we start playing, I'm going to, you know, campaigns last a long time, right? I'm going to come up with, oh, you know, here's a cool idea. How about, you know, some floating mountain where a pair of dragons live or something like that. And then I'll look at my map that I've already shown the players and there's right. no place for for it, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, if you start small, you give yourself breathing room, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to come up with cool ideas later that you're going to want to be able to insert. And so you've got to give yourself room to do just that, right? <laughs> um, I love that perspective too, that r- rather than, um, that's just such a forgiving way to look at it, a positive spin on it, right? As opposed to don't fill in the map or you'll paint yourself into a corner. It's you will, your future you is going to have great ideas, like embrace that and have past you have set a little side for those future great ideas. Like, I think that's a very comforting (laughs) um, (laughs) tenant to have as a GM. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, the GM's not a novelist, right? You haven't written out the whole thing ahead of time, or at least I hope you haven't because you probably wasted some time. Um, (laughs) You know, you're, you're going to keep building as you go. And so let that happen. Right. Um, I, in my, as a player too, 
you know, you can almost have this, there's almost a similar kind of thinking that might happen in a character's backstory generation. I am, I am as much averse to generating a, a strong backstory for my character as I am to like coming up with my own, my own huge world. Uh, I, I like to sort of discover as I play in a lot of ways. And so I kind of like this idea of uh, approaching your character backstory too, as you know, that character is part of the world. It, it, it's some fragment of world building and, uh, not feeling like you have to have all of the world of your character mapped out either because you'll have good ideas for that character later. That at least, that's how I tend to character build and I like that a lot. I think that's brilliant um, for exactly the same reason that the GM doesn't want to, like you said, paint themselves into a corner. Um, you know, th- something's going to happen and, and in the campaign and you're going to want to say, oh, you know, my uncle was part of yeah. that war. Right, but you didn't even know that about that. I mean, as a player, you didn't even know that war happened when you made your character, so you couldn't right. put that into your backstory, right? Yeah, ah, excellent. That's- so, uh, tragically, character backstories are, are a little off topic for world building, but they're they're a piece of world building. So, we'll I have to. We'll that. be talking about that later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but this is a you know a group of you know. All of RPGs is a it's a social project, right? Um, both as the the characters in your story and as the players around the table, the players and the the GM as player. So, um, can we talk a little bit about world building being more than just the GM's job? How do you world build as a group? I think that there's a number of different ways you can do this. Um, I think that uh, well, like so the game that. Uh, that we released Invisible Sun has this baked right in that yeah. you spend the first session where everyone literally as a group, um, you know, brainstorms and comes up with uh, the neighborhood and the details about that neighborhood for every character around the table. Um, mm-hmm. and because that kind of thing is really important in Invisible Sun and knowing about where everyone's house is, that's an important aspect of the game. And, the other thing that it does, which which really works well, is that it right in that first session, it gets everyone thinking about the nature of that world, which is a very surreal, magical world, right? And so you start thinking farther outside the box than maybe you have thought before in terms of, you know, well, maybe their, their next door neighbor is actually, you know, a sentient song right or or, right. or whatever right it doesn't have to be oh the, he's a baker um it, 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 you can go really far afield with with invisible <laughs> sun and so that that group aspect that group group world building gets everybody in the right frame of mind so i think that it's really effective that way mm. um another thing that i really like um is i've done this before in in uh like a fantasy game is I've said, okay, everyone is going to make their character. And then as you are making your character background, you are creating the place you, that you are from, right? So if you're from some big, if you're a rogue and you grew up on the streets, you know, and that kind of thing, and you come from this big city, guess what? Design that city, right? Oh, cool. and, and, you know, oh, you're an elf. You come from these magical woods. You get to design the magical woods. And then it's the GM's job to just kind of bring all that stuff together, kind of stitch it together, stick in a few other things and, and then, you know, um, kind of be the, the, the mortar between all those bricks. Right. And uh, I have to imagine in the process of doing that, that the player who's, you know, creating the thief's, uh, you know, home city is as they're creating that city, they're probably intentionally or not kind of creating adventure hooks, creating bonds that the GM can pull on later. Like I bet there's a a lot of kind of game campaign kind of uh, plot material that you can sort of pick up on those strings that the players are already deeply invested in and maybe want to explore. Right. 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 I, you know, uh, I think one of the goals of the, of a, of a GM is to make the players sort of, their eyes light up and and yeah. when you go to that city that that your friend has created you're going to see that expression in there right they're going to be excited finally this is this the spotlight is on my creation now and and that's exciting yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, co-GMing sort of for one shots and for campaigns where 
um, you know, just to get my feet under me. I, I found out that I was, when I'm trying to prep a session or do some world building or kind of do longer term plot thinking, I, I have to really talk it out. And so it helps me if I have uh, a cogm of some sort. And um, I, I've definitely found that I, what I love about, part of what I love about world building is just w- with another person is that um, they're going to, you get an immediate reaction, right? So uh, the person who built the city, you know, comes to the, the table and says, oh, here's this cool city. Here are all the things that are fascinating about it. And the, the players around the table will, will immediately have questions or have uh, excited things they want to ask about that that person who's been spent all weekend working on the city just wasn't going to come to, right? So I love the like fresh perspective that world building with other people gives me. Um, I think it, I always feel like the things I create uh, they, they get a new dimensionality when, once they hit the table, once I try to workshop it with someone else, I really never feel like something's quite alive. Uh, cause I, I don't, you know, do much writing on the page. I'm, I am, nothing's alive until it's been spoken at the table and has, you know, gotten that depth from having other players, uh, ask me questions about it and engage with it and, and really make it move. So I am, I, I couldn't world build without a group, <laughs> I think <laughs> is my process. That's really interesting. And I think that that's a really smart piece of advice. Um, and uh, you can maybe hear my dog barking in the background. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, we all, as GMs, no matter how long you've done it, or maybe for those of us who have done it a long time, we, we fall into these ruts that we don't, we aren't even aware of, right? right. That, that, you know, oh, here, you know, Here's the elves, they live in the woods, you know, and, and it, it starts to feel very same, very, very rote. If you've got somebody else there who can interject, oh, yeah, but the trees are made out of crystal in this yeah. elven wood, and then suddenly, oh, yeah, you know, and you wouldn't have thought of it that way. Or, you know, even just sort of kind of a slight tweak can yes. suddenly, you know, make something really, really new. Um, and so I think that that is, uh, that's really interesting. Um, you know, there are other ways to world build as a group too. Um, I personally have a little bit less experience with some of these, but, uh, you know, there are people who play the game sort of round robin style with, uh, where everyone, you're all playing in the same world and the same characters, but you take turns GMing. Yeah. And then, and so now you're all kind of building the world you know, as you sort of pass the torch from one to another, right? It's like a, like a relay race for GMs. Um, and, you know, the thing there is, is to work together well enough so that you're maintaining the consistency. And so if, if when I'm game mastering and I say that the capital of this country is this city, right? And then, and then Darcy takes over and, um, you know, you don't want, uh, to suddenly say that the capital is a different city or whatever you want to mean. Maintain- empire is ruling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, right. That's another, that's another, that's another example of a mistake that you can make into a mystery. Oh, it used to yeah. be that city, right? Ooh, yes. I love that. <laughs> um, what other piece of advice I'd give on world building as a group is, is from the player perspective, um, I love, even in a one shot, getting a little bit of world building, you know, turning things to a player um, and saying, you know, uh, you know, you have this cool sword, you know, you've, you've entered the room. What's your character's uh, sword look like? You know, give me, give me a little details. What does that look like Um, that, you know, this NPC, who are they? Uh, And I think one thing I, I, that I, I found really valuable and have seen is that sometimes players have never GM'd before and so they may not have give, been given the world building ropes um, before. And so I've just noticed that people really uh, tend to appreciate when you uh, show them your excitement for their idea, right? Because right. contributing bits of narrative can be kind of scary and vulnerable sometimes. So uh, something that I've found really useful, whether I'm a player, whether I'm a GM, wherever I am, is uh, is to vocally express the, the great things that I'm seeing around the table, the great contributions, what a cool idea. Yes. And yes, but, uh, no, but here's this, but you inspired me to come up with this idea that does work with my setting, you know, just validate people because, uh, if you know, it's hard to tell if people love your ideas or not. And, uh, my games are always better when my 
when uh, all the players around me and the GM feel really like validated and like they can speak up and, and, and share their really off the wall ideas in a safe place. So validate your people and tell, tell your GMs and tell your players what you love about their ideas after the game too. You know, I think that's, uh, that's so helpful for me when I get that feedback. And I think it's been really helpful giving that feedback. That is really, really good advice, you know, because ultimately I think the reason that world building is so beloved by so many GMs is because it's an outlet for their creativity, right? I'm creating something and I'm giving it to my friends to, to enjoy and, and so that we can all play together in. And, and that validation uh, that you get from the players, the, the validation that you can give to the players, you know, even if it's just, hey, you created a really cool character that fits into my world really well. Exactly. Way to go, right? Yeah. That, it just makes everybody really happy and, and, you know, really glad that they are playing this game together. Oh, excellent. Um, the, there's a lot in, in your best game ever about creating great table dynamics. So I think we'll have to leave that whole world of expertise uh, for another video and, uh, and definitely for deeper dives in the book. So likewise, uh, we have not touched on, on many aspects of world building that'll be oh gosh, yeah. um, <laughs> explored deeper uh, in your best game ever. So uh, definitely uh, let us know, you know, participate in the conversation. Uh, we love hearing other people's experience with this advice, um, your best tips, some of your, uh, your own stories to share about how things have gone really well or problems you've had. So participate in the conversation by, uh, in social media using the hashtag your best game ever. Um, you can leave comments of course below on the video and, uh, participate in the conversation there. And, uh, I think we're, we're all going to be reading along and, uh, fostering greater games together as we uh, experience, try, all try to have our best games ever. So um, check out the book, yourbestgameever.com. We'll bring you to where you can get it or pre-order it. Uh, and we're going to be bringing you more videos to go along with this. So we hope you like them. All right. Uh, have fun world building at home and let us know everything about how that's going. Uh, this is Darcy Ross and Monty Cook for Monty Cook Games. Go have your best games ever. Have fun.